Unless you've been living under a rock, you've probably heard that on April 30th, a new mode within Destiny 2 will be coming out, the Pantheon. The Pantheon will be taking existing Destiny 2 raids and taking some of the best encounters and having you play them over a period of weeks. It'll start to scale up where the first week you play four, then five, then six, then eight bosses. And each time also the power level requirement. So it's like five below, 10 below, 15 below, and 20 below. Some of the reasons for this, these encounters is that it will give you chances to get raid exotics. Most of you probably are looking at these videos, probably have that, but if you're missing one, this is a good opportunity to do that. But what I'm gonna do in this video is, obviously we know based on leaks what the encounters are. And in this guide, I'm just gonna go over with timestamps all of the current encounters that are planned to be in the game and how to do them based on how we do them today. Now, I'm going to give you a caveat. This is a refresher, especially for those of you maybe you haven't either, either you've not played some of these encounters in a while or maybe you've never played them. This will tell you exactly how the encounters are in the game today. They are likely to change in some minor way, whether it is, you know, modifiers or some small mechanics. I would expect big changes. So if you watch this video, you should at least get directionally, this is how you do these encounters. And this will be one of the best ways to prepare on that April 30th, so you can get in there and at least start getting that loot before we have full guides. I will post full guides later on during this process. Enjoy, guys. Golgoroth is a big, ugly, <laughs> pretty ugly uh, creature that lives in this one room. This room has a pit area down in the bottom that has some, if you look at, that has some actual doors and things down there. And then there's a corridor that goes around the top that also has doors where enemies will end up coming out. So the key to this encounter is at the very beginning, you're going to want to call two people that are going to steal Golgoroth's gaze. If you've done Caretaker and Vow Disciple, it's a very similar concept. So those people are going to be right and left. Everyone else can divide up, and it doesn't really matter where they are. Usually we do right and left, you know, two and two, but it doesn't really matter. Ultimately, what they're going to be doing is going towards the back and just killing ads. So killing ads, which will allow you to get, you know, ammo and things like that. It's great for ammo runs. But that's basically all you're doing at the beginning of the encounter. Then once all of the ads are cl uh, clear, you will then have to take the people who are doing the taking the gaze. You will need to take those people on the right and left. Now, ideally, they would want to set up towards the front. The primary reason is when you do Golgoroth's gaze, you're going to have people doing DPS from the pit area underneath. To do DPS from there, they're going to have to be able to see his belly. And when you shoot it and take the gaze, the belly opens up. That's how you do DPS. So being as far forward as possible, there are a couple boxes on the side you can also line up in, but being as forward possible is probably the ideal thing. So you'll also notice that there are there's an orb at the top of the room. That orb is how you do DPS, and I'll explain more in a second. But when you first take the gaze, you're probably going to want to start with the person that's closest to that orb. So again, the gaze follows where the orb is. So do that. And then while you're doing that, the other gaze person plus the people who are doing DPS need to work on it. They can do this even in advance, taking that orb down and dropping that into the pit. Once that drops in the pit, they can come down and they can basically do DPS. So again, that's you could do DPS anywhere, but that's where you get extra damage against the boss and is really the only way you can do it consistently. The other thing once you're in there is you will get, somebody will get a buff called Unstable Light. If you get that buff, what you're gonna wanna do is run away from the fire team. In D1, you would just run away and hide. In D2, you could actually run up to Golgoroth, get close and detonate because that will actually do some damage. If you stay in the pit with everyone else, you'll actually kill your entire fire team. So again, don't do that. So once you do that, the two gazers are basically gonna be doing countdowns to each other. So they'll count down 15, 20, you know, 15, 10, five, right? Once they get to about five or three, you're gonna want the other gazer to basically start working on taking the gaze. Now, you can either, if you're really good, you can do a sniper or something like that. You can wait till really close to the end, but I wouldn't chance it. I would basically try to start at three and try to put some serious damage into him to get him and shoot him in the back to get him to shift the other way. While you're doing that, the other gazer and the people who are doing DPS are gonna to need to take the next bubble out. And you can see the technique. And so you're gonna do that going from left to right or right to left through six balls in the pit. And that's an entire DPS phase. Now, the one thing to keep in mind is if you miss a ball. So for instance, let's say you only did one and that left five that you never got to. Well, he has a white mechanic where if you get to six total balls that you didn't get, that will wipe the entire fire team. So it's really important to go ahead and make sure that you're getting all the balls as, as soon as possible. The other thing to keep in mind is there are gonna be ads that are continuously streaming into that pit area. So the other person's not gazing, 
um, would probably want to go ahead and when they're possible, use Wither Horde and things like that to continue to, to take out the ads that are in the pit. The other thing you could do if you really struggle with this is you could designate one person that all they do is clear ads. I don't think this is necessary, but if your team's struggling, that's something you can do. And so that's basically it. The Caretaker encounter is similar to the Golgoroth encounter within King's Fall with a couple of twists. So first off, you're gonna divide up into three groups of two, but it's a little bit different this time. There's gonna be his Caretaker, which is similar character to Golgoroth in that you're going to need to exchange his gaze to keep him busy because he's trying to get up to your fire team and wipe your fire team and trying to prevent that. So have the first two people get near the Caretaker and essentially what they're going to do is they're going to shoot him, grab his gaze so he concentrates, and then stun him. You stun him by one person having his gaze and the other person stun him in the back. This will stun him for a period of time. With a good group of people doing this, you can actually extend how long DPS goes on, but also give your runners, we'll just talk about in a minute, enough time to be able to do what they need to do. The next role, which you probably want to do with two people, again, you could do more if you struggle for some reason, but the next role you're going to have is your runners. And this is my favorite role. This is the role I like to do. So for the runners, they're going to, on each floor, they're, you're going to notice, first off, you're going to have one door at the beginning. What they're going to do is they're going to take turns running into a room, which you open up with little nuts, and looking for symbols. As they're in that room looking for symbols... They're going to notice that there's going to be a pervading darkness buff that will eventually kill them. So they do have a time limit. They're going to run in. They're going to look for three of the symbols. And you're going to want to run through them. Now, again, if you get stuck for time, you can do less. But this is the most efficient way to do it. Run in. Get the three symbols. The reason you want to have one person on the outside is because that person is going to shoot the nut to let you back out. As soon as you're coming out, you can call out the symbols. And then you guys can divide up which ones you're shooting, right? Because there are going to be three of the symbols that are going to be on the obelisk. So time it together, three, two, one, however you want to do it and shoot it. Now, depending on how good you are, you can actually call them out ahead of time. As soon as you can get out, the other person can actually shoot them all and then he can go back in. So once you're out, the other person's going to go back in because they're going to get the next three symbols. And the reason you're doing that is because you want to stay out and get that pervading darkness off of you. Because if that gets to times 10, it's going to blind you and it's going to kill you. So we're going to have the next person go in. They're going to do the same thing. Their job gets a little bit more complicated because there are less symbols, so they have to look a little further to get them. So they get their three symbols. They call them out. You or they go ahead and input them in. And then you have six of the nine put in at that point. Once you're done with that, the last person, if you've done three, again, if you're running out of time, you can do less than that. But keep in mind, as they're doing the stuns, that caretaker is working his way up the stairs. So for that last person goes in, it's actually pretty easy. You just pick up whatever the three ones in, and at that point, as you exit, okay, just have the person shoot them because you know the last three. Now, if you've taken less, you've done two at a time or something like that, that may not work, right? But that's, again, that's typically if you're running out of time, if you're trying to do this encounter, and maybe you're, you know, have too many stacks. Like, for instance, if you have more than, like, five stacks and go back in, you're going to be really quick. If you're more of that, there is no way you're going to have time to go get three symbols. Now, if you get all of those three symbols, right? If you get those three sets, do all nine and do it in time, that's where you'll be able to do DPS here in a second. Now, the other two people, what they're basically doing at that point is ad clear. Now, depending if you're playing as master or not master, you may have champions, you may have other things to deal with. Again, same thing as the first encounter. You can use things that are really good at ad control, right? Uh, Wither Horde works really well here. And you can even do that with the people that are potentially either stunning and even for the runners, while they're sitting there waiting, they can help out with some of the ads. But also doing things like stasis or strand can also help out in ad control. Now, if you've done a good job here, again, you're going to slowly work the gatekeeper up because that's what the people who are doing the stuns are doing, right? You'll have kept the ads clear and you'll have the people finishing up with the running. Now, if you struggle with the running, you can have a third person run because it is possible so if you have three people running, that since you'll have two people out there, they can also help with ad clear. And then you have one person that's just primarily not clear. So again, just depends on what your, your, your fire team is struggling with. But the real key is having a really good set of stunners. Because if, you, if you're stunning the caretaker constantly, you will have a ton of time to make up and get the things you need to get done. At that point, what's going to happen is the caretaker, whichever stair he's coming up, he's going to, he's going to end up at a plate. Okay? That plate is where you'll first 
he'll end up right near there is where you'll do damage. It'll light up. Once he does that, start doing damage for a little bit. And then at a certain point, you'll see the second plate light up. Go to the second plate, do the same thing, and then he'll go to the third plate. A couple tips when it comes to DPS is he is uh, gated. So one of the things we typically do is we do a lot of damage on the first plate. We'll do a little damage on the, on the, third, on the second plate. On the third plate, then we unload. And one of the reasons you want to do this is because then you potentially can get to two-phasing him, right? Because otherwise, it gets a little bit difficult because it's planned to be something that has three, so you're doing all the floor. Once you're done with this the first time, you're gonna notice that you have to go up the stairs and you have to go to the second floor. On the second floor, you're now gonna have two doors that the runners have to deal with. So that means a bigger area, a lot more jumping. There are more open areas where you can fall in the holes. So what that what, that's one thing to keep in mind. So when you're doing this, invisibility helps if you're trying to go through, because usually we just ignore the ads and we try to go around them. So the, again, invisible helps with that. Anything that will protect you will help out. If you're on a hunter having stompies on or having a, a class like a Titan or a Warlock that jumps better, probably helps out here too. Outside of that, the mechanics work exactly the same. If you don't kill him or get him to his final stand on the second floor, then you have to go to the third floor. Third floor gets a little more complicated. There are now three doors they have to deal with and a lot of vast jumping areas you have to go to get the symbols. So that's where your runners, again, your stunners are the key, but if you don't have good runners, it can be problematic. But again, if you have really good stunners, you could send a third person if your fire team's struggling with this. Again, on each floor, you do damage the exact same way. Whenever you get him to down to his smallest amount of damage, he'll have a final stand. Now, economy, Ammo economy can be an issue in this encounter. That's why running double special is a really good idea. You might have, if you really struggle with this, you can have outbreak at the very beginning, at the very end. The main reason why is at the end, if you get him down to that last stand damage, you're gonna see stairs that come down. It doesn't matter what floor you're on, on first, second, or third, whatever, that's where it's gonna come down. And if you don't do it at the third and he still has extra damage, you still have to get to the final stand, even if it's extra. You're gonna have three plates you proceed on to do damage to him. So. Keep that in mind. If you have far away stupors, things like that, try to conserve those to a little bit later on if you possibly can. But again, just start piling damage. And again, if you're struggling with economy of ammo for some reason, or if you don't have the supers that you need, then you're gonna wanna make sure you have outbreak or some sort of kinetic that does decent damage. And outbreak works well, because if you do it as a fire team, you do more damage. That will save you many times. Like I said, the biggest challenges with Caretaker are making sure you have really good stunners, you know, fairly decent runners, and then making sure you balance your your ammo economy because ammo, especially the end, becomes a real problem, kind of like Oryx in many respects, where you can run of ammo for that final stand and that can wipe your fire team. In this encounter, you're gonna notice there's a bunch of planets scattered around the room. To best show you how this works, I will put up an overlay that was done by the Danger2468 on Reddit, and thank you for doing that. In this overlay, you're gonna notice that there are four plates that are on the right and left. In other words, two on the right, two on the left. The dark is on the right, the light is on the left. You'll notice each of the plates has three planets on them. I will get in later how you can call those out to your fire team during the encounter, but for now, just imagine that there's three. They're like a triangle on each of those. There's also in the middle, there are plates these are the plates that you're going to be doing DPS from later in the encounter. There's also three additional plants in the middle, but we'll go over those in a second. You're going to want to split your fire team into these groups, into two people who are doing ad clear and four people who are going to be runners that'll run from one side to the other of the room. As far as where the groups are located, what I would do is I would have each of the runners on each of the plates, right? One on each plate. And then the ad clear people, it just depends wherever your team feels comfortable and potentially where people are struggling with clearing ads. There will be a lot of ads in the middle, so you could be in the middle, or you could be on the plates with some of the people if you need to help them kill their heavier enemies. You're gonna clear out waves of ads in the middle and ones that are coming onto the plates. When you do that, centurions will spawn. You have to kill the centurions. Once you do that, there will be four colossus that will spawn in each of the plates, one on each of the triangles. When you kill colossus on your side, you'll be able to see the polarity of your side's planets, which ones are dark and which ones are light. On each of the plates too, if you're in the dark side, you're always gonna see one planet that is light. If you're on a light side, you're gonna be see one planet that's dark. Your goal is, is to get those planets to switch sides so that on the dark side, you have only dark planets. And on the light side, you have only light planets. So what you're gonna do is, and there's multiple ways to do these callouts. I think if you look at this overlay, 
if you're an LFG group, this is probably the easiest way to remember things because it makes it very simple because you know which plate it's on and which position it's in. Alternatively, players have used numbers like numbering everything through one through six. I ran a group that ran everything one through six on left and right with the odd plates being inside. So like three and five being on the inside of each of the plates. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter which way you do it. Just whatever is comfortable with your fire team. So in that case, then what you're going to do is for the person, let's say you're on the dark and you're going to go pick up the one that's light that's on your plate. You're going to run all the way across. The person who was on the light side is going to tell you where to deposit it on their side because it's where they picked up their buff. They're going to come over and deposit their buff on your plant you started out with. You're going to do this both on the top plates and the bottom plates. Once you do this, the plants will switch. If you've done that correctly, an indexing mode will start where you can actually get closer to a DPS phase. Now again then, you're going to have uh, Centurions and Colossus spawn in the middle. When you kill the Colossus, you'll be able to see the polarities of the planets in the middle. At that point, what you're going to do, you'll see like it's two light and one dark or two dark and one light. What you're going to want to do in this case is you're going to have people go and pick up buffs from any random planet that corresponds to that. So just go to two dark planets, for instance, and go to one light, pick up their buffs, bring them to the middle. If you do this correctly, it's going to start a DPS phase. So the DPS, you'll notice the boss. The boss will turn. This is very similar to the mechanics within Garden of Salvation. The boss is going to turn either dark or light. Okay, during various phases, you'll notice three plates. Those plates will either be two light and one dark or two dark and one light. When the boss, again, when it changes, again, you'll see him. If he's light, jump on a light plate, wait until it, you know, wait until you see him change. Jump on that plate and just wail on him at that point. Then, similar to Caretaker, he's going to either change, he's going to say the same color or change a different color. Jump to the color of plate that corresponds to that. There'll be three total plates you get to do DPS on. Once, that DP, once those three plates are done, you hop off. And that's a run of one of the phases of the encounter. Like most raid encounters, you have three that go up to an enraged mechanic. If you don't get in there, you wipe. All the other activities work the same with exchanging plants and everything like that. And then the very end, you're going to get to a last stand. During the last stand, you're going to have three plates to be able to do damage on. The trick here is, is as you're doing damage, he at the very end of each plate is going to put like a fire attack that you need to get off quickly. Think about similarly with Kallus, when Kallus would fire the gun when you were in Leviathan. Very similar to that. So when you first begin, you'll be brought into an area and you'll notice that the area is divided up into almost three zones. Again, similar concepts, right, middle, and left that you've added to other parts of the raid. You're going to have your teams split up into three, into two teams, one in the ground area and for with three people and one in the space area with three people. There's also a glowing wisp you'll notice in the middle and you'll also notice that there's some elevators. Those will come up in a minute. The glowing wisp you will not want to use until you're ready to start the encounter. Once you start the encounter, the three people on the ground are going to obviously stay on the ground, and one of the space people are going to stay on the ground as well. We'll get into that in a second. The two people who are going to space will, again, if they can go invisible, that's great. Just make sure Atrax will be there at the very beginning and you don't want to be killed. So have them maybe kill a couple ads and then immediately go up in the space. When they go up in the space, they're going to, and which is one of the coolest things in any raid ever, they're going to want to split up into right and left and start killing ads. The ground team and the one person that is from space that's in the ground are going to kill all the ads, including the servitors. Once the servitors are killed, you will have one vandal show up that'll have, again, it'll have the operator symbol on top of it. Kill that, and the per other person from the space team is going to pick up that operator and then go up through the elevator. At that point, once the operator gets on the elevator, they're primarily going to stay in the middle and stay near the elevators. We'll, we'll talk about that more in a second on why. But the again, you can continue to kill ads, and then you will see a scanner show up on the space area and you'll want to have one of the people on the team pick up that scanner. So now you're going to have an operator and a scanner both in the space area. One of the things that's probably important too, just to get timing correct, is we don't kill all the ads in the space area until the very end, and there's a reason why. If you look at this map that I'm about to show you, you'll see that they're the boss spawn areas that are both in the ground team and the space team. Obviously, you'll see the Atrax folks that are already in the room but what you don't know of those replicants is which one you need to kill only the scanner can see that 
once all the ads are killed. So what you're going to want to do is, again, wait till everyone's in position. The scanner typically want to have them somewhere towards the center on the space area, again, so you can see all the replicants, and then kill that last ad. And then what you're going to notice is that one of the replicants is going to grow, is going to glow yellow. At that point, the scanner is going to call it out and everyone head to that area. Now, the DPS on this is very, very tight, so you're going to want people to head in and you're not going to want to hit the replicant until everyone's there. If you are running out of time, because you'll, you'll you'll wipe if you take too long, if you do run out of time, go ahead and start. Doing some damage is better than nothing. But ideally, you want everyone to get there. And because of the short duration of DPS, what we typically use is Lament or Swords or things like that. That's typically the easiest way. And do as much damage you can during that time period. And you can either use debuffs like a bubble or you can use you can use tether or things like that if you have the time to do it once you do enough damage you're going to notice that the replica disappears once that happens the person with the scanner immediately is going to take the scanner and send it back down to the ground area the operator continues to stay in space and there's a reason for that once you send the scanner back you're basically going to do the same thing in the ground area and what you're going to do is basically you're going to identify which replicant it is and everyone do damage and then you're going to do that a total of four times before everything resets you kind of have a lull period the other thing you'll probably have noticed is that when you killed one of the replicants you'll notice that there's a little wisp that shows on top of it a little like ball Someone on the fire team has to pick that up. If they don't, the replicant will actually respawn and wipe the fire team. What you're going to want to do is the operator typically in space, you're not going to want that person to pick it up because the operator is the only person that can shoot that debuff off of characters. So you're going to want to make sure if possible towards the end of the DPS when you're hitting them, if possible, the operator should kind of hang back a little bit at the very end so that they don't pick it up. If you do pick it up for some reason, it does get complicated. You can potentially use ricochet rounds and things like that to shoot it off of you. But again, it does get a little complicated. So try not to do that if possible. So you pick up that, de that buff and the debuff is going to have a 42 second timer. And you'll notice on the screen that there are four airlocks that you can basically shoot that out of. What we typically do in the interest of time is we wait until two of those debuffs are accumulated. So there'll be one in the space room, then you kill the replicant on the, on the bottom area, right in the ground area, they'll have another replicant that'll show up. When that replicant debuff shows up on that character, you'll send that character up to space so that they can, sh they can basically deal with it. One of the things the operator also has to do is during this encounter, sometimes when you bring the elevators up, then there aren't the elevators aren't down there. So potentially you could run out of elevators for people to come up to the space area. So the operator every once in a while is going to have to shoot the elevators to send them back down. So at that point, you'll have the operator go to one of the airlock areas. The operator will then have the two people stand near the door. You pick one, you tell them which one, and they shoot the door that opens the door. The two people with the, the buffs go into the door and then the operator shoots the buffs off of them, sucks them out in the space and immediately the people who got the shot off them have to get out of the doors. If you don't, you'll, you'll die also. So again, we do that and you gotta, you gotta be tight about this because while this is all going on, you have scanners and everyone trying to identify additional replicants, right? So as soon as that happens, the person who got shot off from the ground team needs to immediately head back downstairs, right? Because you're again, you're gonna have this whole cycle of trying to cycle through that, identify the replicants and kill them. So you do this a total of four times, okay? Space, then ground, space, then, then ground. Once you do that, then you get to a lull period. Now, if you've done a DPS, you'll go to final uh, final stand, which I'll talk about in a second. But if you do it four times and you haven't done that, you'll go into a lull period where you just kill ads and everything else, and then you repeat the cycle again. Once you complete that cycle a second time, if you haven't done enough damage, you will go into a final stand. So it's important to do as much damage as possible. Once you go to the final stand phase, what you're gonna need to do is you're gonna need everyone to come to space. So it's very important the operator continue to send elevators down and you'll have everyone come up into space and you'll the scanner at that point, there'll be like an unlimited number of Atrax that show up in the in the space area. It seems like that. The scanner is going to tell you which one to go to. Everyone in the fire team will then follow and start hitting that one. And it'll be kind of tight, so people will start getting freaked out and start trying to kill different replicants. That will wipe the fire team if you do that. So it's very important the scanner find that first one, go ahead and kill it, and then depending on how much damage you have left or the timing, you may have to kill a second one. So the scanner is constantly going to have to be looking at all of those so that people know which ones to kill. Once you complete that, that's the encounter. 
As in the previous encounter, you have the same four pillars. Again, as a reminder for those who haven't seen that video, the way we did it is that we did it um, basically like a PS5 or PS4 controller. We did L1, L2, R1, R2. Again, where one is closer to where he came in and two is closer to where Oryx shows up, okay? Those are the four plates. And so for the four plates, you're gonna to need to designate one person per plate to cover those plates and then two runners. One runner will be in the front area, front area being towards Oryx, the other person being in the back. So at the beginning, there'll be a bunch of ads to kill just you know to keep you busy. Then Oryx will move either right or left and he'll go to put his fist down on one particular plate. So that plate is going to be the first plate you jump onto to activate. If you jump on too early, it'll turn red. Wait for a second for it to turn green. That's usually about the time the person has been picked that's torn. So jump onto that plate and you're immediately going to want to scan around and look for the other plate that the second person has to jump onto. So you're jumped on the first plate. The second person is going to jump on their plate and that will create the platforms that the person who's torn will be able to jump on. The other piece of this is possible that the person who has picked torn is someone from one of the plates. So when that happens, the floater in the front or back is only going to be one person, right? That's being torn. The person on the front or the person that's in the back will have to cover one of those plates. So again, if it's L1 that gets taken, then the person in the back will have to just make sure that they're ready to take the plate so the person that's torn can do their job. When you first jump on the plate the first time, you're gonna have ogres that are gonna show up with the drop bombs. You'll need to take these out as quickly as possible. The other thing it's gonna be is there's gonna be knights that wanna eat those bombs. You also wanna kill those as quickly as possible. Those are primarily responsibility of the person on the plate, but it can also be floaters and other people in the area that help out because some of them can be a little beefy. So for the person who's torn, again, and you look like a ghost when you're torn, who's gonna be jumping through the platforms, you basically go to the first plate, the, the plate that Oryx originally put its fist down on. You go into that and there'll be platforms that show up. You go all the way up to the end of the platform, you'll see a little buff. You grab that, you don't have to do anything with it specifically, you just run through it, and then you drop down to the floor. Basically after this, this is gonna complete three times. Now the bombs only come out, the ogres only come out once, but you'll have the same sequence where someone will get torn, they'll have to go through. On that third portion of that, you're gonna get a buff that you have to pick up. That buff is to take out a knight that shows up from a hive tomb ship that you have to take out to be able to do anything with orcs. So go get that, come down, kill that knight, and then you'll get a ring of invisibility, like a force field that's around you. Stay basically in the center. Around the time that happens and you take that off, the people who are on the plates at that time, they're gonna go get close to their bombs, right? So again, once you pick up the buff and you don't have to worry about holding the plates anymore, all the people who are covering plates are then going to go get close to their bombs. And then you're gonna look in your lower left-hand screen for something that says Oryx has summoned the darkness. When that happens, immediately have everyone go to their bombs, stand their bombs for a couple seconds. You'll know you're complete when you see your name says somebody detonated the bomb. As soon as that happens, hightail it back to the middle of the arena because again, if you don't do this quickly enough, you're gonna die. Get into the invisibility shield. At that point, that will break his shield, right? Once his shield is broken, you can do DPS. So at that point, pour in DPS, do everything you can. And that's one phase of this encounter. Once that is complete, he's gonna, Oryx is gonna do one of two revenge tactics. He's either going to drop bombs on you, and you'll know that because you'll see knights that spawn in each of the plates. If you do that, just run around the arena a lot. What we do is people just run around the plates. They're plate people. The people who are runners kind of just run around the middle, but just don't stop because the bombs will kill you. The other technique is that he's going to put a big sphere at the, at the front of the room. In that case, everyone goes to the front, and you try to kill the ads that are coming from the right and left. The reason for that is those ads are going to go in that sphere and mess up the team that's in there. One by one, he's going to take one person out of the main area into the sphere. And your job is to basically kill this shade of Oryx that's going around, that'll warp around the sides. You want to kill him because eventually what he'll do is he'll come in the middle and he'll try to kill you. So you can shoot him on the outside if you see him, and then he's going to rush in. Kill him once you're done. That completes that technique. Once you're done with that, that's one phase of the encounter. So there's a total of four DPS phases that you can do. You could do this four times before you wipe as a fire team. So that's one thing to keep in mind. You're going to need to do enough DPS to be able to do it within four rounds. Obviously, if you do it earlier, 
that's better. Once you're done with this, let's say you get enough damage and you start getting damage towards the end, you'll notice that he has a last stand bar. Especially early on, what I would recommend if you have the phases still to do it, is just as you get towards that, chip him down with primary and try to get an additional phase to gather ammo. If you have ammo, if you have supers, or if you're on the fourth phase anyway, you don't have a choice. But if you could do that, what that allows you to do is do another phase of this encounter, pick up additional heavy, get your supers set up and everything else, and then go for that last stand. The last stand is similar to the previous encounters. Once he hits that, he's going to go to the front of the room. You'll see on the right and left, there are going to be ogres that spawn that have bombs. Have someone go out immediately and kill those. But don't go in them to detonate them yet. Once Oryx decides to do his darkness attack again, you'll have the people go in, detonate those bombs, which will stun him and allow you to do DPS. Now at that point, just do everything you can because if you don't kill him, you're going to wipe. One key is, if you are st struggling with DPS, is you can actually detonate one bomb first, do DPS, then shock him again with another bomb and extend your DPS. This will allow you, if you don't have as much ammo, if you don't have as many supers ready, this will give you additional time to finish it. So if you made it this far, you've made it to the boss encounter for the Vowed Disciple Raid. Now, there is a lot going on with this particular encounter. I will say, now that it's not in contest mode, I actually find that this encounter, especially once you get practice with it, it's probably one of the easier boss encounters, but it does require some practice. The good news is everything you've done in the raid up until this point will dovetail perfectly in helping you understand what you need to do to complete this encounter. First off, you'll enter the main room and it's an incredible looking room. I, to be honest with you, some of the, just the visuals and the sound that Bungie's put together for this raid are just incredible. It's almost, especially the boss room, this looks like nothing you'd seen in a Destiny raid, but let's get into details. So first off, when you get in the room, you'll notice the boss that's sitting up there in the middle. And you'll also notice that there are, that's a crystal above him. We'll get to more of that in a second. There's also a middle plate that you can stand on the light up. One other thing you'll notice in the room is that you'll notice that there are totems on the left and right. The way we enable this, and you can do this the way you want to, is we did L1 through 3 on left, R1 through 3 on right, with one being closer to where you entered in the room. So L1, L2... L3, then R1, R2, and R3. This will become very important because you have to interact with these later on in the encounter. You'll also notice there's a boss shield that's over the encounter. When you touch that, that's when you start the encounter. So don't do that until you're ready. Once you start the encounter, you're gonna notice that the boss is gonna shoot out lasers, which will become very important later on in this encounter. And you'll also notice over time, there's gonna be a lot of ads and there'll be glyph keepers just as there were in previous portions of these encounters. Now let's talk about mechanics. So in the middle, you'll notice it's a crystal. You'll shoot that, and that'll give one person leeching force, which gives you, I think, a 45-second uh, timer on it. Once that timer runs out, you'll die. But there's a reason you're picking that up. That is going to allow you, when you step into in front of one of the laters, to get in something called emanating force. That emanating force is what's going to allow you to interact with the different totems this encounter. Now, having only one person with either leeching and emanating force is obviously an issue, because only that one person will be able to do that portion of the encounter. But you, what you can do instead is you can get on that center plate. Let's say you have Leeching Force. What that'll do is that'll present two crystals, one on the right and one left. The people shoot that, shoot those. And then with that, the Leeching Force goes away from the primary person, the person at first, to the other two people. So that gives you more people that have Leeching Force that can interact with the totems. Now, while that laser is really good for the people with Leeching Force because it gives an emanating force, if you're not one of those people, you don't want to have that thing hit you. It will not kill you immediately. It will, however, give you a lot of pervading darkness, which if you get hit multiple times, can kill you. So just try to stay, you try to use cover. There's a lot of cover in this encounter. Try to use cover to stay away from that. And you'll see him. He, he's very, he's on the right and left. He moves. It takes a while before he shoots his laser. So just keep that in mind. Keep in cover when you have the opportunity. So once this is done, the other mechanic is that you're going to want to take down Glyph Keepers. Now, just like with other portions of this raid, you need to kill a bunch of ads to take the Glyph Keepers. So keep that in mind, taking up Glyph Keepers is what you're going to need to open up and look at the Glyphs that you need to use. There'll be one on the right and one on the left. Once you do that, the person with the buff, so the people with the buffs and the people without the buffs will be able to see different symbols. For one portion of the team, it'll be on the right. For the other portion, it'll be on the left. You read those out and figure out which one's common. On the totems, there will be a total of two totems that have that on there. Now, you can, if you want to accelerate the encounter, you can have two people get emanating force, go forward, dunk that in, 
and then advance the encounter that way. But for if you want to be safe, have one person who has emanating force go in, dunk everything in, and then that will basically start advancing the encounter some more. Now let's talk about roles. Roles are pretty simple in this encounter. You're going to have probably three people who are kind of exchanging the leeching force back and forth and getting the emanating force. And then you have three people in ad clear. The good news is ad clear when you're not in contest mode is pretty easy in this encounter. There's a lot of cover. So as long as you're careful and use the right build, you should be fine. Now let's talk about the flow of the encounter. So first off, obviously you've started it off, you've shot the crystal, you've gotten you've gotten leeching force at that point, and you're trying to get emanating force. You're gonna to want to kill adds. Those killing those adds spawn glyph keepers. Glyph keepers reveal the symbols. Emanating force people deposit their buff, stuff we've already talked about already. And then obviously you're gonna to want to continue to have people who have the leeching buff to continue to exchange that to other people. So you keep that going. Once you deposit, I look at it as deposit at the totems because it's similar to what you do in the garden of salvation or you're doing gambit and things like that. The motion is the same. After a few of those dunks, then the shield's gonna move up and you're going to have an abomination that shows up in the middle. So take that out and again, continue to progress this. When you get a total of six of those, you're going to advance the boss phase. So once you get to the boss encounter, obviously, Rolk, Rolk, I don't know how to pronounce that name, but once you get to the, ba the boss encounter, this is like no boss encounter I've ever seen in Destiny. So let's first talk about some of the basic mechanics. As below, the boss will shoot out lasers, again, as normal. It'll be in a cross pattern, so it's very easy as he's moving around. If you pay attention to him and you're in a diagonal from him, it's very easy then to not get hit by the laser. So where you can try to avoid that. The boss is very mobile. He can kick you off the encounter and he does a lot of damage with his glaive if it gets close to you. So again, your head's gonna be on a constant swivel. This is not a boss encounter where you're gonna be able to stay in one place and do DPS. I mean, you can, but he's gonna warp around a lot. So being mobile and being comfortably mobile is very important. To get leeching force, just like at the bottom, he has a glaive. If you shoot that glaive, the person who shoots it is going to get leeching force. Again, very important because you get leeching force, then you get shot for his laser, you get emanating force. People without the buff, the emanating force, are going to be able to see the symbols and where to deposit things. So there's four uh, corners. If you think about it, you can think about it like, you know, like almost like your controller, right? You can take R1, R2, L2, L1, right? You can think about it that way. But it'll tell you where to dunk. So basically, you get your leeching force you get your emanating force. You figure out where you're supposed to dunk it, you dunk it. Once you dunk it, a crit spot will appear on the boss. One thing to keep in mind with the boss and shooting the crit spot, if you happen to hit the glaive, you can get leeching force. So just pay attention to your HUD because you're not paying attention, you get that. Then obviously at that point, you're gonna have to do that roll. Um, but that's one thing to keep in mind. Finish off for the crit spot. So you're gonna do that four times and that's when DPS starts. DPS, I think was confusing for some people on my team. The easiest way is the music will change. That's the easiest way to know that he's ready for DPS. He'll also stand in one place and be mobile, but as soon as you hear the music change, you know he's damageable. So finishing the boss encounter, since the boss is very mobile, Divinity will help, but not standing in one place will. So as long as the person with Divinity can be mobile and kind of feather it, I think it'll be fine. But we found this, this actually helped out a ton because it's very hard to hit his crit spot otherwise. He has a total of three total DPS phases, including an enrage mechanic. So you're gonna be able to have to burn him down. Now, he's not like Gatekeeper where he's gated. You can do as much damage as you want. It's just timed, so keep that in mind. Once you complete one phase, you have to go back down the stairs and do the first part again. At the very end, if you get his DPS down to that very last sliver, right? You see that little, on his bar, there's a little last sliver like most, there'll be a last stand. At that point, it'll begin putting Pervading Darkness on you. When it gets to 10, your entire team, fire team wipes. So that's where it's really good during that last phase to save any supers or any heavy weapons or things for that so you don't wipe as you put all this effort into finishing the raid. I'm going to be very clear here. I am not going to explain how to do the Riven encounter correctly. I have done it. It is a fascinating and fun way to do the encounter. It is in my mind is a extra level up over how the other encounters are done, right? So normally in Destiny Raids, they gradually give you more mechanics. They make it more complicated. They took this to the nth power of this one because there's just a lot going on. I'm not going to attempt to give you, especially for new players, on how to do that. There are plenty of guides. And if there ends up being a lot of demand, I'll go in and I'll make a guide like that, but I'm not doing that right now. So on the Riven Encounter, you're gonna notice that there's six plates. That's for each guardian to stand on and to basically activate the encounter. 
Couple of notes here is DPS is gonna be king. So I, I didn't mention this in Morgath, but one thing you can do for DPS, especially this method, is you can bring in armor from the Dreaming City, and that can give you a significant boost for every piece to your damage. Now, that's stuff that you get through doing the weekly bounties and other activities in the Dreaming City. So if you do have a full set of that, that's gonna help you significantly. The other thing I would say for DPS, the way we're going to do this, in the past, you've seen things like grenade launchers, linears, we're gonna use swords. Swords are probably the easiest way, and if you have Lament, it's absolutely the best way, and we'll probably have someone with tractor cannon, a well. Those are the sort of things you're gonna want for DPS. So once you activate this area, and you head down, you'll notice you're, you're descending through, through Riven, You'll notice that there's an area that's blue. There's two doors. Head over to that blue door. That's what we always do. Once you head in there, Riven can show up in one of two areas, either this area or the other area. So there's going to be two things you can run and do. One person is going to go, I'm going to show you this, this area where if Riven doesn't show up in the area you're at, it's a teleport location where you can basically set yourself up to go to the other room really quickly. So have one person outside kind of sit here and wait just in case you have to do this. You're gonna go into the room and kill ads. What you're looking for is in the front of the room, you're gonna be looking for Riven moving around. There's kind of a black screen there. You'll notice if a shadow shows up. So there's a shadow that kind of goes on the screen. Riven will be in this room and you wanna stick in this room. If you don't see that shadow, then at that point, you're going to want to hightail it back to where that person was standing and you all basically crowd up in that area and there's a five second timer and it will take you to the next room. And then you can follow a path Basically, to go in, it requires going by a tree, jumping down a couple holes, and then you'll end up at Riven. Now, the timing on this one's really tight, and it's going to limit how quickly you can do DPS, but it definitely is doable, and I've completed Riven using this method. Now, regardless of whichever side you're on at this point, you're going to want to get on the... Uh, we typically do it on the left side, but again, you could do it each, whichever one you want. But basically, Riven will come out and Riven's going to have like feet that stick up on two sides, right one, right and left. We set up there, we put a well down, we use our tractor, and we basically at that point wail on her until she gets to her final stand area. So again, this isn't that difficult, it's gonna require some practice, but as long as you have Lament, and if you have the Riven armor especially, but if you have Lament and the Dreaming City armor, you should be able to get to this really quickly. If you struggle with that, there are a couple other ways where you can use things, well, you don't have a thousand voices probably, but if you use thousand voices, that works really well. Um, you can also do, as long as you aim it correctly, blade barrage with using sort of standard solar builds that increase your DPS. The biggest thing, whether you use thousand voices or whether you use blade barrage, is you're gonna make sure you don't hit her eyes. Hitting her eyes is what's gonna cause the white mechanic, so make sure you don't do that. So, the, so that's why the sword method is a little bit safer. Once you're complete with this, then you're going to basically be warped into an area where you're going to have to do a jumping puzzle. During that jumping puzzle, you're going to continuously be dying. So, and there'll be things that'll boop you off. So one of the things you want to do again is make sure you follow the path to get up there, but you're going to not necessarily need wells, but as long as you have a warlock or rift or things like that, or ways to heal yourself a little bit, um, you can get through this. And if you're quick, you may not even need that. You get through that, you get back to Riven. At this point with Riven, you're just trying to do enough damage to finish her. Do that damage, go down her throat, and kill the ball in the middle, and then you're done with Riven. This encounter is gonna take everything that you've learned up to date and kind of combine them to again, finish the raid. First off, as far as team compositions, you're gonna ha have two people who are runners, similar to what you were doing in the very first encounter. Again, in this case, you're gonna have both darkness and light that you have to connect through a series of nodes to get to the end of the raid. While they're doing that, you're gonna have four people doing ad clear. You wanna probably split those up, again, depending if you're playing contest mode or not, you wanna split those up on right and left, and you wanna have probably some of the people also concentrate in the middle. Couple key things as far as ads. There's a lot of ads, so use things that will help you with ads. Don't be shy, especially in contest mode, about using wells and supers because you will get them back through killing ads. So again, if you need those for survival, do that. And again, as far as ads, there's tons of Cabal. There's also Centurions that will show up on the right, middle, and left, different parts of the encounter. Those you'll need to take out, especially as the runners get towards the end of the room. As far as the runners go, I'll put up this infographic that kind of shows you what you're doing, okay? And this is one of the reasons why the ad clears will have to continue to advance through the room because you'll be starting from the beginning, from spawn, from where the two seeds are, because again, there's a seed that's on the right that's dark and a seed that's on the left that's light. 
right? And you'll need to have two runners for those again. Their job is really to continue to connect the plates until they get all the way to the end to six. And again, it's similar to Garden Salvation as once you do, you know, one color and the other color, that's where you, the boss will be ready for DPS. Nezarak is going to put his hatred on you on three people that are in the fire team. And he's gonna, that's that's how you aggro and he chases those people around. Very early in the encounter, you're gonna wanna shoot his chest. Someone's gonna want to, to take that off of them because over time, that's actually gonna lead to white mechanic if you're not careful. Take his hatred, but keep him generally pointed toward the fire team. The reason is, is because people are going to have to shoot his two shoulders, right? Similar to Walk. The reason for that is he has a white mechanic that happens halfway through the encounter. And to prevent that, you need to basically create a protective zone for everyone on the fire team. You're not gonna know if that's on light or dark until you finish shooting the so shoulders. Once you finish shooting the shoulders, you'll see that. It'll kind of glow up. You'll see if it's dark or if it's light. At that point, the person, so if it's on dark, let's say it's on dark, for instance, the person who has the buff, again, the buff you get from shooting the orbs will need to go over to the dark side and basically shoot the dark one. That will make you protective zone where you get a buff that lands for about 15 seconds. Everyone in the fire team is gonna to wanna to go near that because if you don't have that buff when he does his white mechanic, it will kill you, which will lead obviously to you not completing the encounter. One of the tips I would give you is that I would get in there initially, kind of run around, right, to keep him occupied. And then you'll notice at some point, he'll glow a little bit white, like he's getting ready to do the white mechanic. At that point, dip back in, get the buff at that point. At that point, everyone can go back to their previous locations and complete their roles because he's going to do white mechanic but it won't matter because you have protection so play continues and you continue to work up and you know through those six locations okay and then i'll put this infographic up here once the six are complete you're going to want to find a location where you're going to dps my fire team that I was in when i completed this we picked the location that's actually indicated on this infographic so get in that location okay and it's a fairly lengthy dps cycle and at that point, use wells. We were using rockets, Izignagis, you know, using Gallahorns, we get wolf pack rounds, and continue to pile on him. Once he finishes up, he's gonna go immune. And at that point, you start the whole encounter over again. Same mechanics throughout this entire thing. He has three phases with an enrage. And once you get past then, there's a the final stand. For final stand, actually the final stand is not that beefy on this boss. So at that point, use whatever you have left. If you have outbreak, swap over to your outbreak, take him out, and you finish the encounter. So it's a super fun encounter. I, I'd say the biggest thing is just survivability because he's kind of a jerk and he will chase you around the room. So, you know, do the things that allow you to be survivable, whether that's, you know, being on your hunter, going invisible, using your wells, using bubbles, things like that. But again, use that to survive. DPS isn't too bad. That's the video, guys. If you like it, feel free to like the video, subscribe to my channel, jump my Discord, and I'll see you, Guardians in the Tower.